And I will share my screen as well. There we go. All right. Hi, everybody. This is our uh, Chaos Industry OSPO working group meeting. So it's nice to have you here. Some new faces. Um, other people that I, I know as well. So it's good to have you here as well. Um, Emma, I did see you put something on the... So the first two things are from Gary. So Emma, do you want to, are you available to talk about your things? Did Emma just drop out? Maybe she'll be back. Yeah, it looks like she just dropped off. <laughs> okay, bad timing. I was just about to call her out. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Um, all right. so. I think really just the the agenda for today is I, Gary had put on to talk about AI contributions, generative AI contributions that people are starting to see, uh, whether in their open source communities themselves or kind of from the perspective of your company. So I can I can go ahead and, and kind of lead some of this discussion. Um, I'm I'm suspecting that many of you are involved in open source communities in some way, some form or fashion, either as maintainers or contributors or something like that. Um, are, you know, within your communities, are you seeing um, reactions from community members with respect to generative AI, where say additional contributions seem to be coming in from, that seem to be manufactured from generative AI, are you seeing policy put in place inside of, of communities? How are your projects approaching these generative AI contributions? Um, I can uh, uh, talk a little bit about this. Hi, everyone. My name is Chan Vong. I'm from the Comcast Open Source Program Office. Um, my team is a, a small group, um, and we're distributed all over the U.S., um, and um, my primary role is to work with um, both people inside the company at Comcast and externally uh, to do upstream contributions and to receive contributions for our projects. Um, I actually haven't seen any generative AI contributions being, being made to our projects. Um, so, and... And I think it's it's kind of tough. It it really um, means that we have to provide a lot of education to the maintainers to uh, be able to see, to identify who is whether a you know a pull request was made with generative AI. Um, we also have scanning tools that could probably catch that as well. And so we do scan our code, um, but it, it'll be interesting to see if if we get any. Um, as far as um, contributions that we make out to other projects using generative AI, I think that's a little bit more tricky in that um, if you generate something with AI and then you, uh, whether that's text or something, I think the licensing and the copyright are get pretty complicated. So I believe you're not allowed to copyright any text that is generated from AI. So um, I, I uh, screen all of the ones that go out and we actually do not um, uh, publish anything made from generative AI yet. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's mainly because of licensing and copyright issues. Um, and that's just from my perspective coming from a large uh, company. Thanks, Jan. Does uh, Comcast have policy? Is this written policy or is it just kind of, you know, known throughout the organization that this is how to approach generative AI? Yeah, we have policies, principles, frameworks. We have it all written out um, okay. for all of our employees to, um, to go by. But then those policies are also made from the current laws that are out there for generative AI. And okay. I know those are still changing um, in the industry. And so, you know, 
we we keep an eye on the from the OSPO point of view, whether for the open source contributions. Okay. Do you ask um, upstream contributors from Comcast to make a declaration as to whether they've used generative AI? No, not right now. We don't. Um, okay. I think it's mainly been, uh, you know, we we don't have a declaration, but that's a good idea. Maybe I need to add that in my form when people are contributing. Do you use that? We we actually have a different mechanism, um, not on the open source side of are you using generative AI? And if so, okay. how is it being used? So it's probably going through that process. Okay. Um, but again, we're we're still trying to figure out um, and and kind of improve how how to do this. You know, it's it's all still very new. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I totally agree with that that yeah. too. That it's completely new. Um, other folks are are any of you seeing? Whether I guess whether it's at the community or at your company, kind of responses to generative AI. I uh, I saw nothing here, uh, data okay. log about this, but um, I see that more and more people is using things like Copilot as part of IDE. So technically, you're using generative AI for boilerplate. The autocomplete is generative AI these days. Mm -hmm. If you use Silio from Shed Brains, if you use uh, VS Code, uh, and I don't think anyone is going to write unless you do very, very, very specific novel thing, write code without those tools in five years from now. Uh, you, you don't think people are going to use generative AI to like write full blocks of code? Is that what you mean? I mean, like everyone is going to use it once it's integrated in IDEs. Oh, like, yeah. It's, just, it, it's <laughs> I, like, it's a smart autocomplete, so it like, it's like thinking the parallel like 10 years ago, like, did you use autocomplete for this code? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I <see what> you're <laughs> <saying>. <laughs> it's like, That's the parallel, like autocomplete. And like, why wouldn't I use this tool to help, to help get me where I need to be? Yeah, I, I don't think that... Yeah. I don't know, I use it every day, Copilot now, and like, if I ask it for write something that is more than 20 lines of code, it's failing miserably every time. But for little pieces like, hey, I need a for loop that pick up everything here and put it there and check some API. Okay, and it wrote something, I edit it a little, uh, that's it. And I don't think <clears throat> AI can claim copyright from that. Especially until they define traceability, <laughs> because without backward traceability, the copyright they are using, where it's coming from. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you using it in this case, Damien, to like start a new coding block, like get you eighty, like get get it lifted off of the ground, or are you using it um, to like kind of clean up what might be a PR to a project, you know what I mean? Just kind of <laughs> make it prettier on the back yeah, end. Yeah, I, I mostly use it like when, so I switch languages all the time. Uh, when I switch from one language to the other, it's like usually like a good thing, like, yeah, I want to write this particular function, blah, 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 and it will at least give me a skeleton of the thing in the language yeah. I am now, and I can do the mind switch on that. Yep, exactly. Like, oh, now, yeah, this, I need to care about the spaces. I'm in Python now. <laughs> and then I need to write 100 lines that I should just copy paste from everywhere. I'm in Java. <laughs> okay. Because uh, one of the cases I had heard as well was people using generative AI to kind of smooth out pull requests that might otherwise be um, <laughs> closed without merge because they're ugly PRs, perhaps, or not kind of following I, process. I can, see a, yeah. I can see a lot of use in uh, writing all the PR documentation outside from the code if you are a second language speaker. That's... Yes probably always happening these days. Like if you have it integrated there, it will suggest things and it's going to be 
better. Yeah. Everything I, I write is going to be like, oh, yeah, you use it in, in place of on, and you use a D, and yeah. there is no D in this phrase, and because it's another language. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want contributors worldwide, I would see it a lot to, to be implemented in those tools, especially if GitHub starts adding it there and other okay. companies adding it there. Like providing that as a service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, other thoughts from people on the call as to where you're seeing generative AI show up? Maybe in your, again, in your communities or in your, or in your companies? Yeah, so I should I'll say them from Natris group. Uh, yeah. What you've seen is uh, the gen AI has been a little unspoken onus, I guess, on the tooling organizations rather than, you know, the organization themselves putting across something. Mm -hmm. There's a reason in some way, uh, right or wrong, I will not comment on it. So what is happening is uh, most of the organizations are in some way binded by their own tools, actually. And when I say binded, I mean is every of their working or, you know, the value chain is involve some other, uh, other tools rather than their own tools. Uh, so for example, in Natris Group, we have GitLabs prominently used as a CICD tool. So the onus is on, let's say GitLab to bring some Gen AI ones, mm -hmm. which they have introduced in the bank, like the Google Duo. Now, this is one, you know, sphere of conversation. The second is, you know, the banks like us, um, they are, you know, sort of venturing into more of more of customer digital experience side of things. And hence, uh, they may be using some models within the bank, maybe building some wrappers on top of it and offering it to customers to service them actually. That is where uh, could potentially come in. But I have not seen organizations putting efforts on building something of their own around the Gen AI. I may be wrong, or I may be uh, talking in terms of all my limited knowledge. Mm -hmm. Are you talking um, about like, the reference? Are you talking like models and data sets and weights, like that kind of stuff? Like building their own Gen AI, like, like <laughs> tooling internal to the organization. Is that what you mean? Um, not tooling, yes. In some way, yes. In some way, no. What I mean both is uh, most of the things, like say for Natural Group is doing is for the customer experience side of things. Mm -hmm. So they are building something which in some way would help the customers in turn actually uh, in servicing them. Uh, however, there are cases where in the bank of ours, which as I said, you know, the let's say GitLab, uh, you know, provides a Gen AI Go, uh, GitLab Duo, as it yep. is called, like, right? So we are using in the bank with a bit of customization. I won't say completely customization, a bit of that customization. Uh, for Emma, what I've also done is I was going through one of the uh, uh, studies that has been recently done by the Wharton School and the other. Uh, you know, the school, Ivy League colleges uh, on the GNAI with the high skilled worker. As a reference link I've shared across, uh, people can go through it if and time permits and interest goes on. So, what they've said is a quick uh, summary of it is GNAI has boosted productivity, but for the people on the junior level by 26%. Uh, however, uh, the higher ladder of senior developers have saw less gain out of the Gen AI at the moment. Uh, reason being is uh, since the junior developers or engineers are not so experienced, so they are using this tool to get that experience side of things. However, the senior developers have already so much experience that they don't need nitty gritties of coding to help them through the Gen AI part of it. Uh, and of course, there have been some time saving, there have been some automation to it. So I'll quickly wrap up on this. Thank you. So Doug, 
can you share that uh, work? I'd be interested in reading more about how they came to those conclusions because in, um, in practice, I actually see um, people of all levels taking advantage of AI and, uh, but just for different reasons. Um, I think um, developers early in their career are looking at it to help them get some, um, uh, uh, some code that they may not have learned yet. Um, and then I think um, uh, developers later in their career know what they may want, but um, may not have time to write all of it. So they're, they're building, they're using it for maybe building out kind of the baseline of what they would expect it to be or, and or adva advanced code as well. I mean, I think I've kind of seen it throughout all levels. Um, so I'd be interested in seeing like what, uh, you know, wh what kind of developers they looked at for, to draw those conclusions. Uh, yeah. To answer you, I I'll give it two points. Point number one, uh, which is important. You know, the most of the questions, you can go to the link. I've shared in that in the, you know, on, on your pointer itself. Anyone can open it and go through more of the case studies. Uh, what I've gathered from this case study is that the senior developers have, you know, rely on their no knowledge and their expertise more because they have been groomed of not using Gen AI. Let me put it this way. Uh, I want to share my experience here. I, I've been coding for 55, 25 years now. I code regularly every single day. Uh, the first few months I didn't use Gen AI because there was all these copyright things, worries, and no company will allow it. But today, I do everything with Shen AI. I just, I, I mostly write C++, and in C++, I go and say, like, kind of the structure of my software. In a minute, I have the structure. And then I know I have to fix, like, 20, 30 lines, and I get something running. If you go... I, I did an experiment before getting convinced of the start using it. And I have an application that I was developing for a few months, uh, some BitTorrent client. And I tried to rewrite it, explaining to the AI how to do it. And yeah, it has a ton of bugs, but in a few days I got the application running because I, I knew what I wanted to do. And yeah, the, the code didn't even compile from the AI. It was really stupid bugs. Uh, read after and uh, right after reading things uh, it has pointers pointing to wrong places but it made like thousand lines of code in the first day i fixed those thousand lines of code to work in two three days and i had a project that took me months so i i don't think that senior people is right now writing because they know the code i it might be depending languages in some cases. Maybe Python people likes to write code because it's shorter. But for those languages like Java or JavaScript that you have boilerplate of hundred lines in to define a class or stuff like that, it like all that stuff I don't write anymore. I just tell like I want an object that has all these properties. Do it, and I want to print it here, and I want to debug it here, and then I do the fixes, but I think uh, you will see more and more senior people doing that. Uh, maybe they are late in the game because probably they are older, like me. <laughs> this is a good conversation. I have I have one question, and then maybe one, uh, maybe two questions. One is kind of far out there for people, and maybe one is a little bit more pragmatic. Um, would you ever see a scenario where a company would use generative AI internally to solve to solve their problems as opposed to going out and using an open source solution, say like a library? And the reason I ask this is because, as all of you know, like working in open source has, has an overhead associated with it, like copyright license, having people contribute to the upstream. That's just there's an expense to doing it, but you get a lot from it. At least that's, you know, the cost benefit is, is really good. 
Do you ever see a scenario where a company might say, you know, we, we can do this work internally through generative AI tools, internal to the company, <laughs> forget working in open source. That's too that's much. A, <laughs> you know, that's just something implemented. No way. Something is implemented, is tested, you use it. Yeah. Like what you will use generative AI in that case, it will be to ask, hey, do you know what's the library that does all this shit that I need? You'd ask the question <laughs> of where to go look. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, Paris. Um, I haven't been coding actively or been in my coding team for a couple of months now, but I'm interviewing and talking to a lot of engineers and software developers and everything on a regular basis. And I think there's a little disconnect between the developers or the people inside open source community and the external people that view open source and the technology together. One camp is saying that I can write everything single in AI, period. That's one camp. And then the internal is, um, I'm not sure. I don't see it taking over the world. I, I still need to do everything by hand. But to me, um, the first AI tool was spell checker, right? It was a rule-based spell checker, right? And then they started adding a little bit of grammar to it, right? So. If I look at that as an evolutionary, you know, type of thing, right now I think there's just so much um, energy on creating things, but we haven't had a lot of energy on vetting things or actually utilizing things. If you think about the world where we are, right? So I think um, I think it would be a great tool to assist us in the same vein as how I use a spell checker, because me personally, I am terrible at spelling, right? So I'm, I'm, and even though half the time it still spells a word correctly, but the wrong word, <laughs> all right? Because that could be the case. I think um, AI in terms of me just like writing a stack or something for repetitive types of things, I think it's great. But from the point of view that I could talk to it like data on Star Trek and it, generate code and solve all my problems, I think right now there's going to be a lot of code bloat on that, right? Because it's going to do that. So I think it's something that's possible in the future. But my concern is, let's stay focused where we are right now. Right now, to me, it's the evolution of, you know, from spell and grammar checking to now I'm just um, context is helping me with the context and everything. I hope I don't mean to take up too much time, but that's that's the two camps I'm getting, but I'm also getting a camp of, you know, I don't trust it to everything that's going to solve the world tomorrow. I like, I have not heard that uh, analogy before to the spell checker and then particularly grammar <laughs> as that has evolved over time. So. But technically that, te technically in the world of AI, it would be a yeah. rule-based. Yeah, and it's bumping you to make improvements is what it's trying to do. Sure. I agree. Um, all right. So then maybe my, thank you for that. Maybe my last question here is, are there, um, are there metrics that you would want to understand inside of an open source community with respect to generative AI? Are there things that you would care about trying to understand? Like, do you care that contributions are coming in as generated by generative AI? And maybe you don't, I, I don't, I'm just curious. This is the chaos side of things, you know, like, is there anything we need to be thinking about measuring in this regard? Yeah, Paris. Um, my concern with it is the same concern with humans, right? I wanna make sure that we're citing when we're using it, where we're using it and how we got from how we're generating, right? This, I don't believe in the blind faith of trusting things because how do we get rid of bias and other types of things in it? So I, I I have no problems with the use of it. I have the use of I have a problem when people are trying to hide the use of it. Okay. As as their own work, but the truth of it, I don't have a problem as long as there's citation, source, you know, some kind of supply chain. The same problem we're having right now with technical debt, right? <laughs> we yeah. just need to know, right? Some sort of declarative process that, okay, gotcha. Damien, I'm curious if there's any, you know, like for all the communities you work in, 
Is there anything you'd ever want to see? Because like we always ask questions about like how people are working, you know, like from a health perspective or. Um... No, no community I'm engaging. In. Okay. Uh, I mean, like I'm in a few email lists of different projects and nothing was mentioned about it. I think people are using it and that's it. That's uh, the Because the, the big problem initially when everything launched like two years ago and this started to be a thing for everyone yeah. uh, was that people might claim the copyright of the original source of the learning but the companies doing the machine learning are having a big success on avoiding that discussion <laughs> so <laughs> okay because definitely the machine learning is not the author that's for sure mm -hmm. the author is some open source project in github that fed that <laughs> Let's say if you kind of get five lines of code from the machine learning, they will look pretty much like five lines of some other project. Fair. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Gift or Chan, are there, like with respect to participating in communities and this interaction with generative AI, are there things that you would wanna understand or know with respect to community activity? Um, I, I'd have to think about that some more. Okay. Um, sh could we add it as a question here? So I can. Yeah. Um, so like if your company is Something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I want to uh, save that in my mind and think about it. <laughs> so thank you for putting it out. I think this has come up a few times across the Chaos Project, just as as this is becoming a little bit more prevalent through things like Duo that was mentioned and obviously Copilot. Like, mm -hmm. do we care <laughs> or do we not care? You know. Um, is it just an evolution or is it something that we probably need to keep a closer eye on? I'm not sure what the answer is, and this is a really helpful conversation. So, all right. Um, thank you for that. That, well, I think Emma couldn't couldn't connect and the other was on probably the Probably the answer there is on legal. Say that again? Probably the answer if we need some metric is on legal. As far as legal don't care, I don't think we care like legal legal like, departments they yeah, they yeah. they might take a position about this at some point if this is something that might affect copyright might not affect copyright yes. and as soon as you have a legal department that decides on that we might need to do some metric about it okay. i didn't heard about any yet okay Okay, that's fair. I'm wondering, like, I would, it, from that perspective, Damien, like that would, that type of question that we would ask against the communities would originate from the companies themselves, not necessarily from the communities. Okay, fair. Okay, great. I, I think that's a point well taken. Um, all right, I'm at the end of my agenda. <laughs> so I think we're good to go. You know, a lot of people are traveling. I really appreciate this conversation. I think it gives us things to think about just with respect to metrics and generative AI. So appreciate the time. Thanks for coming. Okay. See ya. Thanks for okay. organizing. Have a good rest of the week, okay? Take care, everybody. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.